There we go. This is what I'm going to. All right, so hi, Phil. So I'm going to be talking about using planet hunters to assess the Kepler inventory of exoplanets. So this is the entire Planet Hunters team, development team, everybody who's worked on data, helped get it going, Deborah Fisher's PI, Chris also did a lot on the project as well as PI of the universe and on the science team. What's the size of photo represent? Um, <laughs> power on the project <laughs> is what I'm going to say. Um, you know, I, PI of the universe, PI of the project, yeah, yeah. you know, I feel like they needed to be a little bit bigger. Um, thank you for noticing that. So just to give a quick review of transits, the idea with a transit is that when a planet moves in front of its host star and it's line, if you are looking at in the plane of the orbit, you see a d drop in light. And it's basically the, the, sur the ratio of the surface area of the star, the planet to the surface ratio of the, the star. So for the same size star, bigger the planet, bigger the drop. So this is actually real Kepler light curve. So Kepler is uh, NASA's space mission that's been staring at 150,000 stars, or it was for four years looking for the drop due to planets, like transiting planets. So here is a, uh, we're assuming it's a sun-like star, and the blue is a Jupiter-sized transit, Net Neptune is green, and uh, red is Earth. And so, you know, it's a 1% transit drop if it's a, a Jupiter-sized object going around the sun. It's a 0.01% transit drop if it is an Earth. So Earths are hard. But you can do this in space. Kepler has 30 parts per million errors, or it did at least in the Kepler field, in a Earth-sized transit is about 100 parts per million. So with Kepler, it blew the world wide open to rocky planets, their frequencies, um, not the, you know, the things we can't do from the ground, we now can do. So Kepler team has been working really hard at using automated routines, and many other groups have started to do this as well as the data has become public to look for, for planets or planet candidates. So why were they planet candidates? Because there are other things that can go in front of the star and block out somebody's light. So I just wanted to make that statement that we, these are all planet candidates because we can't confirm them unless we have masses. There's a whole bunch of Kepler planets that were just confirmed about 700. So there are ways you can try to statistically do this, but you know, it's a sample and some of them may not be real. But the Kepler team have been looking through and using automated routines to find these kind of planets. And the idea has been, or planet candidates. And the idea, at least when the first quarter of Kepler data was released and Kevin was a postdoc at Yale, and I was also starting my postdoc at Yale, and, and Deborah and Kevin were thinking of what you could do with citizen science and exoplanets, was that maybe the you know automated routines would not do so well on data that's variable. And this is just a snapshot of stars from the quarter one of Kepler data. And I think you can see there's a wide variation of what the stars are doing. And the thought was that perhaps the automated routines might miss something. So maybe we can do the needle in the haystack and look for things look for transits. And I mean, you can see here, this guy right here, and your eye is really drawn to him. You can all see the transits. And so when they saw that one, it was sort of like we knew what we wanted to do with the data. So Planet Hunters launched in December of 2010. This is what our interface looks like. Since it launched, we've had over 280,000 volunteers logged in and non-logged in, that sort of combined estimate, have done 20 million classifications, where classification is coming to the interface and assessing a 30-day segment of a capital light curve. So the quarter one of Kepler data is 30 days. Other quarters are actually 90 days, and we break those up into three 30-day chunks, roughly. So how do we actually do our decision tree? There's two modes of operation. So if you're not logged in, we basically you go straight to, does the star have any transit features? Yes or no. If it's yes, go mark away and drop off. If you're a logged in user, we ask you a little bit more about the stellar variability, and then you go straight into the other question. I think a key for us, and we probably, I would say, is the poster child for talk is at the end was, would you like to discuss this? And having it be an actual, active question. And, um, and so, you know, for people that haven't seen talk, this is uh, Planet Hunter's talk. So you can go view the actual, all the data we have on the site and, and a link from Examine Star and also make all the comments and stuff. So I could spend a whole talk talking about discoveries from talk, and I'm not going to. So, I'm just going to highlight them, and you can read them really quickly or come back to my slides later. So we've had finding circumbinary planets, planets orbiting two stars, where you're actually seeing the eclipse of the stars as they go in front and behind each other. And on top of that, you have the little signal from the planet transiting. These have yet really to be found automatically. There's now one group that's been able to do that. But most of these are all found by, found by eye. And just pointed out, that's the planet transit. That's the stellar eclipse from the smaller star going behind the bigger star. We've also found uh, weird dwarf novae, 
um, finding our library stars in their discussion tool, as well as a whole bunch of planet candidates that the Yale group has been confirming. Um, and these are just many of the papers that have come out of sort of most of that analysis. So I'm not going to talk much about that. I want to talk about what I've been trying to do with the decision tree and trying to understand what things we can find and to do better, um, particularly with the next phase of Kepler coming along. So, you know, I think this is what we're getting out of the data. We're getting a bunch of transit boxes. So here I just picked a random <laughs> Kepler light curve from quarter four Kepler data, each of the colors and the different views are drawing, drawing their boxes. So five people looked at this light curve. This one's a really easy example. It's a Jupiter-sized object. But clearly people can identify these. And so my plan has been to go from a user waiting scheme to actually identifying these individual boxes. So just want to show you a little bit of what I've done before with quarter one of Kepler data and just a user waiting scheme and get into the new stuff I've been trying, trying to get going in the last few months. So for plant hunters, most people actually want to do a few classifications and leave, at least for quarter one. It seems to be the same for other quarters as well. Um, and so the idea is I'm trying to use both non-logged in and logged in users. For this case, actually, initially with the waiting scheme, I really only looked at uh, logged in users and weighted them, and non-logged in users got a weight of one. I've now changed that, and I include everybody as, as long as I have an IP address. But it's the same sort of process that's going on here. So, you know, we have a few people mark the light curves. In case for quarter one, we actually had synthetics as well. We had about 7,000 synthetics that were um, Kepler light curves where we didn't, as far as we knew, didn't have short period planets in them. So we called short period anything that had, you know, periods less than 30 days. And I injected simulated transits into those. So that was my sort of benchmark sample. I also have a tr another true sample, which is we know there are planets. The Kepler team has already analyzed that data, so I have the Kepler planet candidates to compare to as well. But in case they have their own systematic biases, the simulations give me another ground truth. So volunteers looked at that. They also looked at the real Kepler light curves. And then I developed a waiting scheme based off the original Galaxy Zoom um, waiting scheme. And the main idea here is that I'm up waiting people if they agree with the weighted majority vote and down weight them if they disagree. And so it's an iterative scheme that's get calculating the transit score for all of the light curves um, that have been classified in a quarter. Then it computes for each of the volunteers their, their weight. And that is, you know, for each score, it's the sum of the weights of all the users that said, yes, I marked a transit box divided by the sum of weights of everybody who viewed it. So I start off with everybody at one, then calculate the score, and then I calculate each user weight. And so that is, they get the sum of, you know, they get the, for each of the light curves they looked at, they get the, the light curve score they, they got for their answer, such as if they said, yes, there's a transit there, then they'll get the, the light curve score for that star. If not, they'll get one minus that because that's the that's the probability for no. And then divide by the number of light curves they look at. And I keep iterating through this. And then also normalize. We try to keep meeting near one. So it, I keep iterating until I get conversions. And then I have a final set of light curve scores. And I also have a final set of user weights. So looking by eye, it looked about 0.5 in transit scores where noise started coming in. That by looking at it, I couldn't find anything look at that looked realistic. And I tried to be pretty good at not looking at Kepler planet candidates. So we did check some of the simulations, but keeping that I was not trying to be biased by what Kepler had already found. So that's the user waiting scheme. So there are in this case we actually did see it a little bit by using the simulations, but it doesn't actually impact it too much because we didn't stringently wait based on this. Um, and down here are people who marked a few and completely disagreed with the uh, with the majority vote. And so if you only do a few or one or two, it will keep the, the waiting scheme will keep pushing those people down to the bottom. So, so this is what the distribution for quarter one I get for the for all the light curves. So in this case there are about 150,000 light curves up the light curves. A cut at 0.5 gets me down to a little less than 6,000 light curves. So already I'm not doing so bad. And this includes eclipsing binaries, known planet candidates, everything in the wash. So not doing so bad right there. But we still need to do enough work to figure out a candidate. And so for this analysis, what we really wanted to know is what do we find? And is are there, at least for short period planets, are there significant things that the automated routines are missing? What is their completeness as well? Because they haven't don't have a completeness yet. They have a human, they have a review, uh, 
automated step that identifies potential transit candidates. They have a human review step that then reviews that with a subset of people, and then those somehow become adopted into what they call Kepler object of interest and then planet candidates. So they don't yet have a process that goes through with simulations all the way through that entire process, particularly the human stage. So we're also giving them a bit of an attempt to efficiency as well. So one thing I found is that stars were pulsators people didn't do as well on. So the people like to, to mark lots of transit there. Obviously, it looks a bit more like transit, but we have that as a question we ask for login users. So I could use that as a threshold cut. So just taking a, a, a simple average is able to do a slightly higher cut of, of transit score of 0.8 on those and remove them pretty quickly. So then that left me with about 3,000 uh, light curves to look through that were real and then also about 6,000 simulations that also need to review. So we took that all together and put it into a round peer review system and asked volunteers with, with the really simple interface with the boxes drawn and colors and darker color overlaid. So the darker colors mean higher density of transit box area. Do you see two transits, yes or no? And that was able to get me down to a set that then I could compare to the Kepler sample. And so what we found is when you remove eclipsing binaries, you remove the known Kepler sample, there's only about five, tra five transiting systems that they didn't identify in that first set, first analysis, which they subsequently picked in a, in a, when they, in a modified version of their pipeline. So what it's saying is, is we understand our detection efficiency. We can say something about the fact that they, they, we basically, they found most of the short period things. So what did that actually mean? Well, I can use the simulations for that. And so since the simulations went through the whole same process, and we don't tell volunteers until the end after they've classified a simulation, whether it's real or not. So they classify, and then they get a message that says this was a synthetic simulation. And we show where the simulation, where the simulated transits were. So this is 7 to 10 Earth radii bin. This is Jupiter-sized objects. So the one thing that I was very not very surprised about is that this is pretty uniform in terms of orbital period. So I really did believe initially that people were going to mark, be better at marking planets where there are many, many transits versus where there were two transits in the light curve. And the fact is that's pretty stable over all the different um, radii bins. And so this, we're about 90% 90, 90 efficient for 7 to 10 Earth radii. When we get down to Neptune-sized objects, we're still 85% detection efficiency. Again, across the board. So people, when they think they see something, they mark it, even if it's a single transit, which means I do think we have a niche for that. And I think we've been showing those with many of our talk candidates. Again, we get to two to three Earth radii. This is where we take the hit. And again, this is where we're starting to get to the smaller 0.1% transits as we go to one Earth radii. So this is where we hit 40%. Just the whole collection so you can see the same thing. So again, you know, above four Earth radii, we're 85% and higher detection efficiency. So now we can actually say that the fact we only found five systems at that point where the Kepler team their initial analysis and then subsequently for the analysis of uh, planet to periods less than 30 days, they are they're, they're nearly 100% detection efficiency for those four Earth radii and bigger. And you can compare it to the Kepler planet candidates. There's only 200 in this entire to make this whole plot. So the error bars are big, but you get the same analysis. And here, this is actually a symptom of the stellar type, so the radius of the star. So when you actually switch it into transit depth, we map our answers become consistent. So basically, we get the same answers with the ground truth of using both the simulations and the Kepler planet candidates. But this whole pipeline that I talked about basically said, is there something in the image? Is there not? Did you? Is there a transit? Is there no transit? I don't actually take into any account where things are, and that's really I think where we want to go with this, and do better because there are multiple tra there are planets that have more than one transiting planet. And particularly, the pipelines do very, that's difficult for them to do. We, they may potentially be missing them, missing additional planets. And I think that's something where planet hunters can do well. Also, being able to quickly identify where their transit is, we could then do another review and things like that. So what I've been trying to work on is a simple friends of friends algorithm to go from, yes, we think there's something there. Let's feed that through. Yep, use the user weights I've got it and identify the individual transits based on the clustering of the transit boxes. So the one thing I decided and have noticed is that the y-axis of the boxes, the y dimension, gives me no information. So you can see here that some people draw, and they just draw around the low points, and others go a little high up. So for this, I've just decided to ignore the y-axis entirely for clustering. I'm only using the center of the box 
in X and the width of the box. And so in this render from that algorithm, actually, I've just chosen to use the simplest thing possible that seems to work. Okay, that's continuing with the mantra. Uh, and so for this, all I'm saying is, is if you, I take the user who has the narrowest boxes, and I take that user and I seed the, seed the clusters. And so I start off with those, and then I look for any box that has its center within the, within the width of the initial seed. And then I keep looking through. And then I iterate, and I move on to the next cluster, and then and the next one, the next one, the next one of these boxes for that first user. And then I go back through and start linking again the friend, the friend and go through each one of these boxes in the cluster and see if there's any other box that has its center within the center of any of the box, within the width of any of the boxes in a given cluster. And it seems to actually do pretty well and handle the fact that orbital with orbital period, you know, the box width is going to change. So if I have one transit in here, or 15, it's going, you know, this, this width changes significantly. And I'm having much difficulty trying to do this with any kind of static linking length. So I don't know if anyone has ideas or trying other algorithms to see how well they do. But it seems to at least right now be at least a decent answer. So the other thing I do is just to get the dimensions of the box. I go back and I, at this point I haven't, I haven't even included the user width. So I go back to get the actual width of the boxes by using the user width and saying, well, I know people are better and more careful marking transits. Let's include that information and scale the weights, scale the weights as I average them for the width. So now I have a modified friends of friends, and sort of this is what it's giving me. I kind of sort of summarized most of this, but I figured I'd just sort of put it out there. The other thing is I've, there are things that people do wrong. So some simple cuts I've been trying to remove is if there's a single low point, they draw a box around it. So trying to remove those. So one thing I'm trying is, is maybe there's a better way to do this, but my dumb answer is if there's only one point in the box, remove it. If there's only one box and there's one point in half the box, remove it. And so that seems to help a little bit. Or flares. So if the box center is above the light curve, remove it, because <laughs> that's not what we're looking for. And so I have a bunch of little cuts that seem to be the simplest things I can think of without losing too much. So just to give some examples, this is about a Jupiter-sized object in an eight-day orbit. Um, so the, each color represents a different user that looks like a volunteer that looks Here's now the clusters that came out of it initially. Um, I think that's the final clusters. Yeah, these are the clus boxes clustered now. So each color represents a cluster the algorithm picked out. And then these are the final clusters with their sizes. And you can see, based on the differences of you know, how which users, which volunteers, you're on the vertical axis. I'm still, you know, even though I'm getting a dimension, I don't think it's telling me anything useful. So one thing I'm interested in is, is there something I can back out of that that might help me identify things that are actually single deviant points or glitches, for example. And I'll show one or two examples of that. Isn't and it, yeah. Isn't it coincidence that all of the points in the previous plot just showed all the boxes have roughly the same bottom? Uh, same bottom? Yeah. Uh, not that, like those don't, but they apparently sort of average to the same. So that's yeah, I th they don't, they're not actually completely there. Like this one's lower, that one's a little lower. So they're not quite. I think it's just because of data points all being sort of really close to the bottom. And you can see the ones that are just a little bit lower. The boxes tend to be a little bit lower. I think it's just because in this case it's a big planet. So we actually catch catching the whole bottom. And it's, you're catching it way far from the light curve. So like on this one, I don't think you see quite that. So this is crazy variable. So I was kind of excited. This is a five Earth radii planet. So I was kind of happy to see this one and see with enough of the, of the oscillation that this, this is still picking it out. Um, so those are the final clusters. This is an example of something I don't know how to get rid of yet. So this is actually a data, data glitch. So in some of the quarter four data, there's a big drop like that, and everybody seems to mark it. So I don't have yet a good way of removing that. But my algorithm picks it out. So I know where all the pretty much all the glitches that look like that in the data. So this is also an example of just noise. So in this case, there really aren't any transits, but the code identifies at least there are several, and then when it does the final cut, I'm left with these two. So the thing right now is my code's generating about 50,000 clusters for each quarter of Kepler data. So that's individual of what it thinks are transits. And so now I'm at the stage of what's the right way of making either this better clustering algorithm or finding ways of, of 
of sort of cleaning through the data. One way may be transit depth. There's clearly many more smaller transit boxes, but how best to do this? So, you know, we're going from, but I, but I think it, you know, this is the, the modified rating scheme I'm now using all of these. The one thing I'm doing, non-launch and launch it. One thing I am doing is saying that everyone who did one classification, I don't know anything about you, so I keep setting their weights back to one. And I'm interested to see what people think of that. Is it the right way to go for that? If you've done one classification, do I really not have any information on you? Um, and that's a distribution for everybody else. But you can see that there's definitely a dominant peak from, you know, that most of, there are many classifiers that have only done one. But from going from 400, you know, nearly 500,000 light curves, because this is 160,000 stars with three light curve chunks in a given quarter, I've gone from that to, you know, roughly 30,000 light curves with a weighting scheme, and then brought that down to 50,000 clusters. So I don't know if, I'm, I'm thinking when I see those numbers, maybe it's not so bad I have 50,000 clusters right now. But I think, you know, why am I, I, why, so I think this is a way of combining it that I can maybe start getting identifications on the fly. And the reason I care is because I want to see that for plant hunters, but I also want to do this for K2. So what is K2? So Kepler suffered a reaction wheel failure, and it's no longer pointing at the Kepler field anymore. So it is now a, a two-wheeled mission pointing in the ecliptic in 75-day campaigns. So they don't get quite the precision of the Kepler field. They get about 100 parts per million errors. They can still see lots of interesting planets, and so they're doing these 75-day campaigns looking at 10,000, 20,000 stars for 75 days. So when you do the numbers for planet hunters, it means that if we even broke these up into two 30-day chunks, left everything the same, we'd be, we'd be in one to two months. If we used 10 people looking at each light curve, we'd be done with running through the classifications. So now we're not playing the game we played with the Kepler data, which is we're always behind because of the data release. All this data is going to release publicly when it, when it gets downloaded and processed to everybody, even the Kepler team. So now we have a chance to start looking through you know, data live. And so I'd like, one of the things I want to get out of this week is taking this weighting scheme and clustering algorithm and maybe developing a new one or modifying what I have to be something that, you know, we could plug into Planet Hunters so that we could, when K2 comes, once that data is processed in one, you know, two weeks a month, et cetera, you know, we can have a whole list of Planet candidates that we can start following up on particularly because no one else is going to be very capable of identifying single transits. So longer period planets in these systems, Kepler's never coming back to them. We can help look at the statistics of those in multi-planet systems. So that's where I'd like to see you know, all the stuff that's going on that I've tried to do and what I hope we're going to get out of this week sort of in play for planet hunters. So with that, I'll take any questions. Yes. So waiting, I can tell that waiting gets me better into the dirt. So I, if I looked at non-waiting, there are things that would be I wouldn't have I would have missed that it helps me get the smaller planet. So it's, I can see it's helping me dig into the dirt. So I don't know how significantly it's helping. Probably for the giant planets, it's not a big deal. But I've gotten that three to four or three di, it's helping, and I probably could do better, right? It, so um, I know one thing I think we didn't, we didn't, we, didn't, we used the simulations to see the initial waiting scheme for quarter one. And I, and I don't think we did it harshly enough. So we could do that and target maybe smaller planets and help that way as well. Um, but I think that's where the benefit's coming. So, so because, I mean, your, your rate's basically between 0.5 and 1.5. Yeah. So, so you're only ever saying, you know, your best person is three times more trustworthy than your yeah. worst. You have that sort of zero, but yeah. worst person. So, I, mean, I mean, the worst person is one to the minus six. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, most, most, most <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's probably me. I checked. No. Um, <laughs> 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 um, yeah, it's, so that's one thing I'm interested in. So one thing I would like to see is if I tried the current waiting, you know, from Galaxy Zoo, would that be different? Would that help me? Or doing something else like the Bayesian multi-classifier? <laughs> Would that pull out different things? So yeah, I'm not convinced this is the best way to do it so far. It's worked enough to, to you know do something with it, but I definitely think it could be better. Suggesting even 
keeping with the same weight, he would just turn it up. Well, potentially, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I think with, with absolutely. Do, actually, well, every, everyone is the same way, apart from people who are uh, demonstrably rubbish. This is Zoo 1, right? Zoo 2, Zoo two uh, yeah. and Zoo Pages 2. Uh, um, because, well, we, we found it didn't make that much difference in anything, it seemed to make it worse waiting to the consensus, which is different to what we know. So, so, so my sense is that these differences are because I think there's something in the, the planet hunters transits are rare, and I think I think in that that's a case that pushes you to more extreme waiting systems. That's my guess, but we should test that this week. Kevin, do you still? So when you talk about the K2, how far in the direction of the kinds of things that um, Stuart was talking about this morning uh, you want to go? Is is the, is the goal really to very quickly retire those uninteresting stars yeah. within days? Yeah. Let's put. I mean, there's. I mean, there's many things I think that become interesting about K2. One is we don't have any information on the stars. This is not the Kepler field with 10 years of like prep work on that field. So one thing is nobody knows what the eclipsing binaries are. And so things, you know, getting out a catalog fast and being able to analyze it, I think is useful. And particularly for multi-planet systems, the cool thing is now you get to go, are all the weird differences between RV and the Kepler field because different solar populations, we're get, you're going to sample the whole thing. And so... You know, I do think that I would love to see, you know, a supernova zoo type of thing where the data comes in, you know, an email burst goes out, and then the data, you know, it's been done. And we have a catalog, you know, within it, you know, shortly after. How frequently will, will they update? Um, every, every, every three months, there'll be a, there'll be a new data set. And then seven months after it's first observed, it'll be a, you can actually go observe it. So it's a different game than the Kepler field. Sorry, seven months after it's observed. First observed by Kepler, then you can observe it from the ground. Just because of where the sun is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, did you feed the simulations into the same interface mm -hmm. that you have with Facebook? Okay. Yeah. So it's that's how you did comment or part of the reading is done with the simulations, right? I did, but I don't. It doesn't make a huge difference. So we did see the weights. People that look at the simulations, we see it a bit. But if you, there's not a huge difference. And one thing I think I'd change if we redid the original planet hunters again would be we made we were nervous about how people would react to the simulations. So they're pretty rare. Is it one in a hundred? So no, it was one in four. One in four. <laughs> I, I think I won the argument to get. I had seven thousand simulations. I won the argument to get enough in. Really? Yeah, it was one in four. <laughs> I think it was one in four. It might have been one in twenty. I might be, but it's definitely not one in a hundred. Okay. Yeah. And uh, about the noise, I want to comment uh, because currently you don't use the y-axis, but with, with the noise, you would have a handle with the y-axis, something like you would take hundred times the width of the box as a uh, check. In that area, you would check what's the noise over your original signal, and if that's the same size of the white size of the box, then you're in dangerous waters. Right. Something like that. That might be something to look at. Also true of small planets, right? That's, a, that's true of warm Earth when you get transits. Yeah. So, I mean, and I can see if I plot in transit depth, I have a whole bunch of like 20 parts, you know, 20 parts, 30 parts per million. So I might be able to start doing cuts there, but I don't. You know, I can tell, I already know that's where we start. We already have losses. So it wouldn't be surprising that that's where people are marking lots of things there. So. Cool. All right. Um, very good. Cool. Very good. How many views per subject? Uh, five. It used to be ten, but so it's, it's five right now. Cool. All right. Thank you.